Just a few great verses from Mark's Gospel. Chapter 1, verse 14. After John had been put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee and preached the good news from God. The right time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is near. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news. As Jesus walked along the shore of Lake Galilee, he saw two fishermen, Simon and his brother Andrew, catching fish with a net. And Jesus said to them, come with me and I will teach you to catch people. And at once they left their nets and went with him. He went a little farther on and saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in their boat getting their nets ready. As soon as Jesus saw them, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and went with Jesus. So this is a great passage. It's not a very complicated, complicated passage, not a very long passage. But it is a passage, it is a story of the lakeside and the first disciples. And rather than me saying, oh, what are all these things we could learn from this? I think you're going to miss it if you don't get the story. I remember once being on a retreat um, and uh, did an Ignatian meditation on this passage where you you think, you haven't got anything else to do for 24 hours actually, you think on this passage, you read this passage and you get that sense of the, um, of the, the lake and sort of, I've not been there, some of you might have been there, by Lake Galilee and scrub and the edge of the, edge of the water and, and what have you and, and the, the men on the, the boats along the side uh, and Jesus walking uh, along the side of the sea, funny Greek, walking along the, the edge but obviously obviously seeking them out, you know, he walks along the beach towards the, the fishermen on those boats and then calling those disciples, just speaking to them, come with me and I will make you fishers of men, follow me. And they do, and they dump it all in the water and they walk up the beach. I remember thinking, actually, in the, in the picture I had in my mind, I was with Jesus, I was behind Jesus watching this happen rather than being in the boat, but Unless you get the narrative, you don't get it. It's a bit of history. It's not, what does this story mean? The story means what the story is. And it's about discipleship and it's about new beginnings, isn't it? But if you look at Jesus walking along the seashore and coming to them uh, by those boats, the actual movement is the big thing that Jesus comes to find them. Jesus had been doing lots of preaching, it says earlier on, and lots of people would have come to find him. There would have been crowds to listening and all that sort of thing, you know. But he comes to find them. That's the whole, the whole narrative, that's the whole body language. Jesus comes and finds them. So that discipleship is about being chosen. And it's easy for the gloss to go off being chosen after a time. I know I'm chosen, but... Here I am, sort of thing. This evening, try and, as you let God speak to you from this little passage, you'll think, wow. What about if I'd been one of the hired men? What about if I'd been Zebedee? Which always makes me think of the magic roundabout. But, um, <laughs> but what about if you'd been them and you've not been called? There's a sense of choosing here. Discipleship comes out of God seeking us out. And I, I lose a sense of privilege and enthusiasm about that very often. And that's wrong. I remember when I was about 16 or 17, I was in the boys' brigade and I reached near the top of where you could be as a boy without being an officer. And uh, so I got the suit and the badges and the cap. You know. Mm. It's playing in the band I was then. <laughs> yeah, the, I don't tell you the symbols. Um, but you know, we did the marching thing, and, and in the battalion, in those days, there was 600, 1,000 boys in the Bristol Battalion of all these companies. I used to go to camps and all this sort of thing. But the thing to be if you were a sergeant is a colour sergeant. You were one of the three sergeants in the battalion. 
who paraded the Queen's and the battalion colour. He had two officers holding the flags, and he had these three sergeants. This is what he wanted. I remember wanting to be doing this. I wanted to be chosen. I wanted to be called to do it. Bolt. They didn't do all that Christian name rubbish then. Bolt, you, you, you could do this. Actually, they didn't call me. <laughs> because I had the wrong colour suit that year and they want everybody to have the same suit. But I remember thinking, you know, looking back at it, why did I want to do that? It meant I had to do extra drill, I had to go extra nights, I had to do extra practice. And when you were on the parade, if it rained, all the rest of the battalion, hundreds of them, could put their max on. You stood there and you got wet. What did I want to do it for? Because I wanted to be chosen, you know? And I remember when I became a Christian and with Crusaders, you know, um, that sense it was a privilege to follow Jesus. In our modern society, you get the feeling that it's an option. Well, actually, it's a privilege. And you lose that with time, don't you? Lots of things. We have privileges, you know. You know, when the weather's cold, you know, people talk about before we had central heating. But once you've had central heating for 40 years, the chime goes off it, doesn't it? You know, it's, you know, you forget the, uh, you forget the uh, frost on the wallpaper, don't you? It, it's, it's... We have all been chosen. That's great. And I wanted you to imagine this evening in your life that, um, this is not talking about becoming a Christian for the first time, but the idea of being chosen, imagine that Jesus is just mosey along the seashore and he's got his eye out for you. <laughs> you don't have to jump out of the boat and walk on the water and find him. He is seeking you out. Oh, that's a privilege. It's great. And we are called to respond, and people in the Bible do respond, usually by arguing, actually. Peter does well at this point. But if we are called, in this story, there is no volunteering. There is no volunteering. Volunteering is a big thing today, isn't it? People say, oh, it's a volunteer. <sighs> really good, yeah. Volunteered. In my job, I'm always looking for volunteers, you know. I used to say, was a volunteer is worth ten press men or something? Something like that. It's not true, but you know the feeling of it, to be a volunteer. I remember in, in, um, in uh, Jason Bourne, you know that. Great, you must know Bourne. Anyway, when it gets to the denouement in the middle, after about three, three or four hours of this, um, the, the guy looks at him over his glasses and says, You volunteered. <laughs> Makes all the difference, you know. Because he volunteered rather than just being caught up in it, you know. And today, society says, you, you've got a choice to make. Well, you do have a choice to make. But there's a real limitation to volunteering. It's a different thing to responding to being called. Because when you volunteer, it's always about you, isn't it? You know. It's always about me at the end of the day. I'm here because I chose to be. That's good, isn't it? Isn't it good? Peter's not standing in the boat waving and saying, how about me, you know? Volunteering has its real limitations, because I've volunteered for lots of things, and uh, it, you always feel good about it. It's about you, really. We're called. It's not that. We're called to respond, which looks a bit like volunteering, but you can't volunteer if you're not called. No, I don't want you. Yeah, I don't want you. No. Yeah. What a great thing. But it's a radical thing, isn't it? You know, because in a way you all volunteer to come this evening, except the ones with the jobs, which is half of us. But you know, it's, 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 I feel it. Perhaps I'm here. It's a privilege. What about it was completely full of people, and you're so pleased to have got a ticket, so pleased to get in, you know? Because we were called, and it just wasn't a matter of volunteering. Talking to some people um, who were thinking of getting married um, quite recently, who, who, who've been together, lovely people, have been together for a long time. And I said, What are you get married for? I said, Oh, well, it's going to be slightly different. Than that. And I said to them, What well, I've said to lots of people, talking to divorcees, that who've been together for a long time and then got married and it didn't work out. And they said this We were so surprised when we got married finally that we were committed and it didn't work out. Before that, 20 years of living together, and it was great, but they were permanent volunteers. 
every day you chose to stay together. When they got married, they were together. Because it was still about them. When we are called by Jesus, when we are called by Jesus, we call to respond, but we're not volunteers. It's all about him. So that's that. You've got to see that picture. Jesus comes along and he calls them. Wow, me, yeah, me. And going on with the story, it says that one of the lots were mending the nets and one of the lots were fishing in the shallow water with stones. And the, it's pretty primitive stuff, really, but hard work. It's, you know these, um, you know when you, you go to amateur dramatics things or you go into um, grand opera or you go to all sorts of theatre, they, they start off with a lot of extras, don't they? The extras are on sort of um, market people or maidens or elves or all sorts of extras, you know, and they're all busy on stage but they're not really doing anything. They're all sort of before the person comes on, don't they? Sort of thing. And uh, you feel that with Bible stories, some of them. There's always extras waiting for Jesus to turn up so that something happens, but they're not waiting for something to turn up. This is hard work. You don't fish, you don't live. Fishing kept, kept, you, kept you alive. Mending the nets was crucial. This is business. This is not downtime. This is real time. Jesus calls these people when they're not hanging out, waiting for something to happen. He calls them when they're busy. In fact, he calls them at a bad time. I think that's interesting. They are not the sort of people in robes sitting there going, when he turns up. What do you want now? Mm. I think uh, Jesus calls his busy people. In fact, all those disciples that he calls, they're all doing something. Matthew is making money, you know. They're not hanging around. We're not here with the workers who were unemployed going into the vineyard in that parable. We're not there at all, no. And, and these, these fishermen, there's hired men in the boat. This is a sign of money. In fact, fishermen in those days were well off. It's like having a farm or like having a, a, a shop and a business, having a boat. It comes down with the family. It's a big asset. Having, being able to get fish in the Middle East, freshwater fish, is a rare thing. They didn't do too bad. Or middle, middle class sort of thing, you know? In other words, there's no evidence in the Bible at all that Peter is thinking, there's no meaning to my life, I need to do something else. You know, that's a modern thought. It's not that. He's not deeply needy. It sounds to me as he's got a good job, he's working hard. He's not saying, oh, I need Jesus. He does, but he doesn't know it particularly. And so we are not necessarily called because we need to be called. You know? Sometimes naturally you think, I'm at a bit of a loose end or I'm at a bit of a change in my life or there's a thing. What does God want me to do? And we're waiting for a call. Other times, you just the last thing you want is a call. I'm busy. I've got an agenda. I've got things sorted. Things are going well. Oh, no. And churches are often full of people with need, which is okay. But actually, I think as the church grows, it needs to have a, a, a cross-section of people who don't become Christians just because they feel they need something. It's very interesting when people become Christians that they're having a good time. They're working hard, they're busy. And you and I, if we're not volunteers, and we're, you see, we're not just giving our spare time, but God is calling us to some difficult times. Tonight, for instance, you say, I've gone busy this week. How, how much time have I got? No, perhaps I'll call you now. Again, the story turns up. They're all working on it. Follow me. What now? Yes. Follow me. It's good. So he calls them. And what does he call them to? Follow me. So the first thing he calls them to, when it says there, be with me. The Greek means be close but be behind. Ready? Be close but be behind. Follow me. Christianity, you know it well, but you can see it in this story, is relational before it's instructional. We, we, because we're very keen on the word in these chapels, lots of our chapels in the circuit have got the word on the back. He doesn't say to Peter, follow my commandments. He says, follow me. 
So that high churches with a massive great crucifix with Jesus up there have got a point, really. We're called to follow Jesus, not just follow Jesus' commands. That's what he said, come with me. And you could have, they could have said, well, what's this about? Perhaps they knew because he'd been teaching about repentance early on, hadn't he? He said he'd been teaching about the kingdom of God and turn away and believe the good news. They probably knew that. They, they knew who he was. But... It's easy over the years, isn't it, to reduce following Jesus to following what Jesus wants. Just as in a relationship, it's easy to reduce the relationship to what you do. And so perhaps it's good if we might think back into that passage that Jesus calls you personally because he just wants you to follow him rather than because he wants you to do this and that and that. It's not that terrible phone call from the minister, how are you, what do you want, sort of things coming, you know? Or somebody invites you to coffee meaningfully. You know, there's no such thing as a free cappuccino, is there? You know, let's have coffee and afterwards I'll tell you what I wanted you to do. Perhaps Jesus just wants to hang out. That's very interesting, actually, with, with sort of the modern church genre, that you do feel that you might go to hang out. Come with me, he says. Come with me. But there remains that bit in the Greek, follow me, come with me, but come behind me. The rabbi was just ahead. Follow me. And when you've got that picture of following up, I've decided to follow Jesus, you follow somebody who's slightly ahead. Christianity is not democratic. It's not run by a committee. When the disciples started arguing between themselves about who was the best and who was going to sit where, it all went badly wrong. It's when they followed Jesus. He was close, he was a friend, they were a band of brothers, but he, he led. That is not against my, that's against my way of thinking as well. We don't like that. We, like, we say, Jesus, we're wanting to lead, but we like a discussion about where we're going. You know, I, I say, Lord, I, I, I want you to, to, to guide me in my life, but I've got some, a lot of ideas and a fair number of constraints, and we need to discuss those. They'd still been on the beach if that had happened. You can imagine four disciples, where they were going to go. Where it would be good to go fishing for men. And, or, you know, they'd still be on the beach. Discipleship is about Jesus speaks and we listen. We're close, but he's just in front. He leads, you know? He leads. I was looking at some maps in the last 24 hours of when I was about... 15 trekking across the Cairngorms on a ba in a bad week. And it was terrible. It's where I learned a bit about agoraphobia. Because the Cairngorms are big. You don't want to worry about Ben Nevis. That's just for tourists. The, ca the Cairngorms, you know, you've got several 4,000 foot mountains, but you've got hundreds of square miles of absolutely nothing. And all that time ago, there was even less nothing, more nothing. And I remember, you know, I'm just being blooded in this. It just goes on raining and it gets colder. I was saying to Jane, I looked at the, uh, the quarry. We, we, we camped in this valley. It's 3,000 feet. It's like camping on the top of Snowden. Just because the mountains went on up, you know. All I remember is that we were a long line of soggy teenagers with blisters and everything was wet and we were miserable and we were cold and we want to go home. This is this guy called Mr. Greenwood. As I say, it was proper then. You called him Mr. Greenwood. You didn't call him Bob or anything like that. Yeah. He saw, and all I know was that he just shouted at you and led you and, and he knew the way and he got you across this river and through this bog and in the end found a barn somewhere. I don't know where it was, but we were all together. But my gosh, we're glad he led us. That's where did Jesus come with? Follow me! Oh, we want to go somewhere else. No, 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 no. Mm. And I will make you fishers and men. I'll give you a job. It's a real task here, isn't it? It's a real task. You're all called to be Christians. But not everybody is called to be an evangelist or apostle. And Paul says, are all preachers, are all evangelists, are all prophets, are all this? Or... No, they're not. So Zebedee needed Jesus, the hired men needed Jesus, but they didn't all need to be disciples wandering around with Jesus. You're all called to be Christians.
but you all got to the same job. I think it'd be good if you could think, Lord, I've been a Christian for a long time, but am I doing the right job? Am I, am I in this right role? Have you got to say, is this good or is it not good? Is it special to arms, as we say in the army? You know, we're all trained, we can all march, but then we all do different jobs. What could he be calling you to? You see? This is important because it's not about conversion, this, is it? It says we, are, we have transitions in life, but Jesus might just say, actually, I'm calling you to. It might be a small thing, it might be a change. Follow me, he says. You say, I'm already a Christian. You say, I know, I know, but I want you to do this and that and that. To follow in something specific, to do something specific. And finally, to do something you can't do. (laughs) That's great, isn't it? And I will make you fish as a man. And this was a great thing. He didn't say, I want you to catch fish to raise money for the good of the cause so we can do mission. (laughs) As we find with Peter, he really, apart from opening his mouth and speaking very loudly, he didn't have any real talents at the beginning at all. So you'd be called, you see, to do something that you can't do. Because why? Because he's going to make you to be able to do it. I always, I've sometimes joked in many churches over the years that when we were looking for new church stewards, I said, don't think that anybody is born a church steward. We're not looking for the one person who, you know, sleeps with CPD. It's not, it's not like that, you know. People become things. People become things. There are things that we can do and become that you weren't born with and you're not necessarily good at. But Jesus can make you. I will make you fishers of men. I'm not looking for fishers of men to share, to be an encourager, to be a welcomer. Yes, to be an evangelist, to give hospitality, to speak the word. I mean, how many of you will say, we need more people to preach? But I could never do that. Of course you can't do it. But who says you couldn't, you know? To do this, I could never do that. But you could. If Jesus calls you, we're not being speculative. He doesn't come up the beach and say, hi, you lads, what do you fancy doing? No, follow me and I will make you. That's great. And so if you pull all this together, there's, I felt when I saw this passage originally in this sort of meditation, it was remarkably relaxed, but remarkably exciting because it was a sense of immediacy. He came along, he called them, they went. That nowness, terrible word, isn't it? That nowness, rather than I became a Christian in 1947 and I'm just chugging along. This sense that you're stuck in a groove, that Jesus comes and says, I think so, I think so. tonight, for goodness sake, tomorrow, this week, you don't have to go on a course. I will bring you something, perhaps suggest to something. To, he, he leads you to somebody, gives you some book to read, gives you something you might try with. Do something with. Don't do it all, just do something. Follow me. Have your ears open this week. And say, Lord, anything but this, 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 and this. You know? And and feel the motion of the story. Gosh, he's come. Calls me. Wants me to follow him. Because the most exciting bit of the whole story is going off up the beach. (laughs) Where are we going? You know? Up a bit of beach, over a bit of rough stuff and through there and up through the fields. Hey, where are we going? Wow. It's worth anything, that is. That's great. So I just encourage you tonight that's to, you know, to say, Lord, I feel you've called me, um, but I'm often jumping back in the boat like Peter did. I just pray that you would re-establish that real sparkle. I have been called. What a privilege that is. What do you want me to do? Anything, as long as I can be with you, you know? I give you a little thing to do. And if he gives you a little thing to do, so don't say, oh, I hoped it was going to be bigger or smaller or something different. Just do it and see where we go. One step at a time. Let's get off the beach before we get to Jerusalem, shall we? You know? Just get off the beach, for goodness sake. What about the crucifixion? Get off the beach. But we just move on.